Hello and welcome to yet another edition of Times Exclusive on Times Television, TTV, but we are also on Times Radio. My name is Wanda Msisia and the program is brought to you courtesy of Rainbow Pense. Wow, I think Capish looks amazing in that role. Mm, the electric blue cuts it for me. Come on, look at the tango, candy pink, mm -hmm. bent orange. Okay, sweet line. Do you like what you see? You can dream it and live it. Download your Rainbow app today and begin the magic of transforming your home into a fabulous space. Rainbow Paints. Peace of mind. Part of the deal. Welcome back. I now have the pleasure of introducing to you who is our guest in today's edition of the program. Our guest, I'm saying our guests because we're going to have two in today's edition of the program. The first one is Dali Soja Ponda. Good to be back. We were here last week, but it's a continuation from where we stopped. Yes. But uh, joining us later in the program will be Imran Yusuf, who is also in Malawi together with Dali So. Dali so you were here last week. We spoke about many things, including the show that was held on Sunday. Now, I want us to start from the show that was held on Sunday. What is your reaction or how? what is your comment on the show that, was, that happened last Sunday? I've done around six or seven shows in Malawi before this one. Yes. And this show on Sunday was the biggest, craziest show we've ever done. It was absolutely amazing. The musical acts were Zete and Makluther. They were yes. brilliant, warmed up the crowd. Then Imran Yusuf, who you'll speak to later, did a great job his first time in Malawi. And then I went on for like 90 minutes. Yes. Or it was just a great show. Uh, Amaryllis Hotel made me feel welcome. The production was next level. I was really happy because I felt like this was a uh, for Malawi. This was the best production I've seen in Malawi. So it was very good. All right. So I, I've, I've seen you interacting with the live audience. Yes. What's, what's the thinking behind that interaction? I always will, when it's a live show, interact with the audience so people are getting something special. Because I have DVDs, I'm on Netflix, people can watch me from their home. Why are you coming to watch me live? It's got to be better. There's got to be something unique. And that's why there's always something extra. Don't you think that uh, the audience sometimes are like, wow, maybe he's going to put me on the spot. You're commenting <laughs> about the more of Africa with just having one shop. You're commenting about this woman wearing a blue hat. Well, um, this <laughs> woman wearing a blue hat who actually owns the baker, yes. she loved being part of the show, right? You make fun of it, but they love being part of the, sh the show. The owner of Mall of Africa, he was there <laughs> and he was laughing. So yeah. this is the thing is that I, am, I make fun of you, but I make fun of you the way your best man would make fun of you on your wedding. It's yes. not mean-spirited. It's just friendly, so everyone enjoys it. How do you get to pick, to say, I'm going to pick that one? Because, look, everyone is there, and you're moving around with the roving microphone, and you don't know who's going to be picked next. How do you get to pick? You can tell body language. Some people are shy, so I'll leave them alone. People who are dressed in a boisterous way and seem open to it are the ones I will go to. And eight out of ten times, I'm right. And if it's someone who's uncomfortable, I'll just move on. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you also did, as usual, you did some jokes about your dad. Yes. And somebody reminded you about another joke about the spy and your <laughs> dad and you was there. Yes. So this is an interesting thing. My father, early on, he had a hard time with my comedy. But now, especially when he's in opposition, he's like, tell all the jokes. Tell all the jokes you want. So, but I think it's people, the whole of Malawi, in addition to my father, have learned that humor is just play. Right? It's not serious. If I talk about the government, I'm not starting a revolution. If I talk about my father, I'm not insulting him. If I talk about someone at the front, it's just play. And so yes. now that he has accepted that, he loves it. In fact, he carries my show on his iPad and makes people watch my shows. So okay. it's wonderful. All right. Now, um, 
the show ended when people were asking for more. Yes. I don't know what are the plans. Are you going to be coming recently? Oh, I'll be back. I'll be back and, uh, in December. We are finalizing the dates with these guys uh, at Emirates and also the BICC guys. And uh, I'll be back at some point in December. There'll be an official announcement in, in a few weeks. But I'll be back before the end of the year with more comedians. When we spoke last time, I know you can speak Chichewa, but a lot of people asked me to say, why didn't you ask him whether he can speak a little bit of Chichewa just to get by? So how, how when good I was or born, how bad is No, so when I was born, I was, uh, my father was in exile. Yeah. So I was born in uh, Zambia, stayed there two years, and then went to Kenya, Somalia. I was always on the move. Each country had a different language. So I speak little bits of many languages, but the constant was English. So I just, that's why. A lot of the diaspora babies, we didn't learn Chichewa because we weren't here. Okay, so do you speak any or zero? I understand zero? and I speak badly. All right. So, so there isn't even a Chichewa phrase that you can... No, there is, but I mean, I wouldn't do it on on television to be made fun of because I don't speak with a good accent and stuff like that. But I mean, like, I, I, now to make but, fun of you but because last time you, the you had only one on use, me. The only use for me is to understand when people are talking bad things about me and think I don't understand. But you do. I do. Okay. <laughs> but I don't, like, this is the thing is, like, if you learned when you were a kid, I spoke to Shao until I was six years old. I have a child's understanding and I'm 42. How much would you remember, really? So I don't yeah. speak a lot of it. But if I'm ever in Malawi for... An extended period I would take courses like I speak French I speak English I speak lots of languages because I live there all right now having performed that homecoming which was massive like you've said compared to the last shows that you you you've, you've done yeah what do you think is the future for comedy in Malawi in terms of the audience and even the artists I think this show which we did shows that there's a big demand and it shows that there is the possibility of production on a world-class level which competes with anywhere. So I think right now it needs, it's a matter of nurturing local talent, bringing in foreign talent which has the caliber which is essential and also just investing in making, keeping the shows at that level. Because the thing is, if the next show is bad, people will stop coming. Yes. So you need to maintain that high level. You decided to bring Imran. Yes. I'm going to have a chat with him later yes. on in the program. Why? Because I have worked with him for many years, and uh, he always impressed me. He's one of the best comedians I've worked with, but also his content is, I feel, Malawi compatible. Right? There's some brilliant comedians I've worked with in England. Are where you the one who told him about the ESCOM guys? <laughs> I because told he was him taking about ESCOM. Like, I'm like, exactly. Iman, how long have you been in Malawi to know about ESCOM? And then the mic is playing up. Is that ESCOM? I'm like, what's going it's on? It's fine. But yeah. comedians, we all do research of yeah. the culture we're in. But yeah. um, with Imran and with whatever comedians I bring in the future, like I'm doing uh, BICC and Salvador from Uganda yes. is coming. Because again, yes. he, Uganda and Malawi have enough common that he the things he talks about resonate yes. and it's all about getting comedians who resonate and also don't offend they're yeah. comedians who are great but in malawi people wouldn't accept their comedy plant air was success yes what should people expect from Lilongwe? so Lilongwe is a bigger venue yeah i've got a bigger fan base not yeah. bigger family but i've done more shows in Lilongwe. so yeah. i think actually it has got the possibility of outshining even this one. It's a competition now, yeah. right? So it's got to be a great show. If I watch the Blanda show, yes. should I still go to Longue or I have one, you've watched one, you've watched all? No, no, you can still come to the other one because there'll be a few jokes which are the same, but yeah. there's also other jokes which I've been writing even just in the days between. Cash Madame has a new scandal. <laughs> so there's new jokes about Cash Madame. Cash Madame, she reached out <laughs> to say that is so. Come on, man. Why are you picking up on me? No, I, she, I've sent her invitation. Come to the show. Okay. She must come to the show. The, in the, the long the, way the show. The Cash Madame joke is going to be there as well. But she will be in the front row, hopefully. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. So look, um, uh, that is so it's been a pleasure chatting been a to pleasure. you. I think we spoke last week and we also had to speak again this uh, area part of the program as I want to, you know, spend a little bit of time with Perfect. Imran. What are your parting words? My parting words is, I'll be back. I'll keep making you laugh until such a time that you are tired of laughing. Today I'm not going to ask you to make a joke on me. Because last <laughs> no. time you did, my wife it's was perfect. like, how dare you do that? So perfect, perfect. I am safe for today. 
Thank you so much. All right, so that's Dari Socha Ponda. He's the one who started the program, but I'm also going to be joined by Imran Yusuf after this break. So don't go anywhere. You're watching Times Exclusive on Times Television TTV. The program is brought to you courtesy of Rainbow Bands. Wow. I think Capish looks amazing on the door. Mm, the electric blue cuts it for me. Come on. Look at the tango. Candy pink. Mm -hmm. Bent orange. Okay, sweet line. Do you like what you see? You can dream it and live it. Download your Rainbow app today and begin the magic of transforming your home into a fabulous space. Rainbow Paints. Peace of mind. Part of the deal. Welcome back. You're watching Times Exclusive on Times Television, TTV, but the program is also on Times Radio. I started with Dali Sochaponda. I'm now joined by Imran Yusuf. Imran? Hello. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm okay. It's yeah. nice to have you in the program. Oh, it's a, it's a pleasure to be in Malawi. It's my first time here. Exactly. That's what I wanted to ask you. Have you been to Malawi before and this is your first time? How do you like Malawi? Oh, I'm loving it. Like, when I look out at this... Uh, when I look at the landscape here, this yes. is uh, it's therapeutic for my mind because I don't get this view back home in London. Yeah. So uh, every morning I wake up and I look at the mountains and it's, uh, it's really good for me. It's, it's food for the soul. Yes. Uh, and the, whole, the moment that I've arrived here, I've just been met with amazing generosity and kindness from everyone. And I'm having a great time and I, I wish I could stay a bit longer, but unfortunately I'm going to have to go back next week. Exactly. It's called the land of smiling faces. You see a lot of people smiling. Yeah, oh, yeah, all the time, smile, when, we especially smile. when we, uh, we went to, yesterday we went to the Majete uh, uh, Safari Park and the whole experience there was great, just uh, made to feel welcome and I just think there's, there's a greater, more soulful, relaxed vibe um, in Malawi than yes. I'm used to getting at home where everything's a bit too fast paced and can feel quite impersonal. Uh, apart from Malawi, have you traveled to other African countries? Uh, I, well, I have. Uh, I was born in Mombasa uh, yes, for start, uh, for, to start with, but uh, I uh, have performed in South Africa, in Cape Town and in Johannesburg. And uh, yeah, and I've visited, obviously went to Mombasa and Nairobi. I have a lot of family in Kenya. Um, and this, oh, I've been to Morocco, uh, but that just feels it's slightly different to uh, the rest of Africa. Um, and then Malawi for the very first time. Okay, we were supposed to start with knowing you, but okay. uh, I think along the way we got carried away. We started talking about you without having to ask who is Imran Yusuf. <laughs> who because am I? people need to know who is sure. Imran Yusuf. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, who is Imran Yusuf? Well, I was, uh, I was like I said, I was born in Mombasa, yes. uh, Kenya. Now my pair, so I believe my great grandparents uh, came from India and settled in East Africa somewhere, and then my grandparents grew up in East Africa. My mum is from. My mum was born in Zanzibar. My dad was born in uh, Kenya, in Mombasa. Um, my, and then what they had, my parents and my two brothers, they lived in Uganda. And then Idi Amin came along and decided that he didn't want that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, throughout all the Asians, so they went to London where they were refugees. Uh, they built a new life for themselves. Then my mum became pregnant with me. And um, my father was working in Saudi Arabia at, at that point. So in order to be around like the, the rest of uh, her extended family, she went back to East Africa and gave birth to me in Mombasa. Okay. Um, so I was born there, but then very quickly went straight back to London. And then I grew up in London most of my life. I spent so one year in... So apart from just born in Mombasa, mm -hmm. that's all that connects you to Mombasa. But you well, grew up... I grew in up London. in London, yeah. But right. my family, like, have come from East Africa for a few generations. Okay. So the Urdu slash Hindi we speak have little bits of Swahili in it, okay. even though I don't speak Swahili, because that's the way, in whenever my parents wanted to talk about me or my brothers at home without right. us knowing, they would talk in Swahili, so okay. and we would be left out. Right. But there's just every now and then we have bits of Swahili that we use in our Urdu or Hindi at home that we're unaware of. Um, and until I meet other Indian people, when I speak to them in what I think is Urdu or Hindi, they're like, oh, what's that word? We don't know what that word yeah. is. Uh, and then I realize, oh, that must be a Swahili word that we've adopted along the way. Uh, but yeah, I grew up in London most of my life. Yeah. Uh, I spent one year in America when I was a kid as well. Yeah. 
Um, what, was and, what was in America? Uh, in America, well, I actually, I actually. <laughs> I actually lived in America and studied in America illegally when okay. I was a kid. What do you mean? Uh, well, I went there to visit uh, my family. I have extended family yeah. in the United States, and I was only there for like three weeks, but they s said that I should stay there and go to school. Now, I was 12 years old, and I didn't know that you can't just stay in a country and go to yeah. school. I just went, yeah, let's yeah. do it. Yeah. And then they very quickly found out that I wasn't allowed to do that. Yeah. Uh, but by the time they found out and we could do anything about it, I'd finished my first year of school. And so I went back to London. Fortunately. The American government have been gracious enough to. Uh, they've been they've been, they've been quite upset and gone. You shouldn't have done that. Yeah. But they're like, okay, yeah. as long as you get the right visa now, yeah. we'll let you in. But don't don't, don't break the law yeah. again. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I was in the st states earlier this year, and I had a great time in Washington D.C. Uh, but yeah, like I said, I grew up in London most of my life, and that's really characterised uh, a lot about myself. But uh, every time I've performed in uh, in anywhere in Africa, which has been Cape Town, Johannesburg, and now. Um, in Malawi, uh, here in Blantyre, and going on to Lilongwe in a couple of days, um, I, it also feels like home. I feel like some. Uh, I, I feel that this isn't a place that's alien to yeah. me. It's a place that yeah, I feel that I, I that, yes. that I've got a connection with yeah. it because yeah. I guess Indian people have been here for a few generations, yeah. and uh, and I like that. I li I'm a bit of a citizen. I have multiple. Like I have multiple passports, if you like, in yeah. terms of like, I can go to certain places and, and feel, feel like I'm at home. Yeah. Uh, whether they, even in India, Singapore, and Malaysia, mm. it's great. The comedy community in those countries, and even in South Africa and here in Malawi, uh, you just get treated like your extended family, and I really, I really enjoy that. I feel blessed as a result. Okay, so born in Mombasa, mm -hmm. then moved to uh, London, England, mm -hmm. then also a bit of time spent in USA. At what point did you realize that I'm, I think I'm a comedian? I think I can crack jokes. <laughs> or is it family meetings? <laughs> or a family dinner? At what point did you realize that I think I'm funny? I think I've it. well as a kid I was always trying to show off and get attention I'm the youngest of of three okay. so, so there are three members of your family. yeah I've got two older brothers and, yeah. and there's me so I think in order for me to get attention I'd always have to like you know shout and make a spectacle a spectacle of myself and uh, I, I just enjoyed that I enjoyed showing off it was something I, I thought I was good at but I didn't know what stand-up comedy was until I was about 16 17 years old and I saw um, there was a TV show the comedy store TV show the comedy store is like like an amazing comedy club in London um, everybody wants to play there yeah. and um, I saw a TV show and I was like wow look there's a place where people sit down and they and a person comes on stage and tells jokes and that's their job and I was like I have to do that that's like that's what I'm meant to do. Yeah. And then years later, slowly, my first career was in video games. Okay. That was what I really wanted to do was make video yeah. games. So I worked in the games industry for a few years. But Did you make any games? I, I worked on a number of games. Okay. Uh, I worked in both publishing Anything and in development. Uh, oh, I don't okay. know. So you may be aware of the game um, Mortal Kombat, yes. uh, the fighting game. Yes. So I yes. worked. I used to work for Midway Games, the big American games company who originally made Mortal Kombat. Yeah. I also went on to work for Sega, who makes Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah. Uh, so I worked on... Uh, I worked on uh, Shadow the Hedgehog, I worked on Sonic Riders and on Yakuza. Yes. Uh, and then later on I went on to Kuju who were working with Nintendo yeah. to make Battalion Wars 2 for the Nintendo Wii. Yeah. And that was great because Nintendo of Japan would come mm. to our office in London mm. and uh, work with us on the game. And that felt like a huge privilege because Nintendo had like, you know, the, the royalty of, of video games. Yeah. Uh, and then pretty soon it became obvious to me that waking up in the morning to get on the train to be at work at nine o'clock on the dot and be told what to do wasn't going to be for me. I want to, you know, get up later in the day, mm. run my mouth off for, for a few minutes. And get paid. <laughs> and get paid, yeah. <laughs> and travel around the world doing it. And so uh, I've, trans uh, you know, kind of transitioned into stand-up comedy, uh, worked really hard. It was, uh, in the beginning, it was very, very difficult. And, uh, but, you know, as if you put effort into anything, slowly you become good enough. And also, uh, if you, it's quite funny that apparently the word Nintendo, loosely translated from Japanese, means you can work hard, but in the end it's all in heaven's hands, all in God's hands. Okay. And I think what I've learned from that, you can work hard and you should work hard, but there's an element of luck, an element of the divine yeah. that you cannot anticipate. But if you work hard, you know, you, the luckier you can get. All right. So, and, and I guess that's why I'm here. I'm very fortunate, very blessed that having known Deliso for a number of years from the comedy circuit in the UK, uh, he was looking for a comedian to bring out to Malawi and he thought of me and uh, fortunately uh, <laughs> I'm uh, lucky. You're available, yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, I wanted to ask about the breakthrough now because you, you, you're that young kid at 16 and you're saying, I didn't know that people sit around and somebody yeah. comes and 
tells a joke. It's not easy. You don't just walk in and say, I have a joke. They have to listen to you, <laughs> yeah, probably yeah. audition you and say, no, you're, you're rubbish. Good, you're rubbish. <laughs> you're at what point, point, at what point did they, I think you got that chance to say, look, this is the day. And you made it and everybody will say, come again. All oh, right. I think the, the day when I guess the industry around me went, wow, he's really good. Yes. Is I was nominated for as best newcomer at the Edinburgh Arts Festival, which is the okay. biggest arts festival in the uh, world, yeah. uh, in 2010. Okay. And up until that point, people had seen me and gone, nah, yeah, whatever. Those, yes. But when I got nominated for Best Newcomer, and then I also appeared on uh, a very pre prestigious TV show, it was Michael McIntyre's comedy, yes, yes. Uh, comedy Roadshow, and he's like one of the best comedians yes, in the UK, yes. if not the world. Yes. And he was kind enough to offer me a spot on his TV show. And so yeah. through a combination of being nominated at the world's you know, largest arts festival yes. and, and appearing on Michael, Michael McIntyre's Tires Comedy show, Roadshow, yes. uh, suddenly that gave me all the credibility that I needed to to then to, to go to the next step, to be able to come to things like this, to be yes. invited to things like this. Yes. Uh, so that breakthrough came, but uh, you know, before that was a lot of hard work, yeah. but before the rest of the world well, when validates you, when, when you. When you talk about hard work, mm -hmm. I, last time I was talking to Dali, so he was telling me that it's about six hours, nine hours of writing, and people think that probably you just go there and then you look around, you pick a joke. When you talk about hard work <laughs> yeah. as Zimlan, what is hard work? Uh, hard work is being focused on your craft. Right. At first, it begins with belief. You have to believe that you know this. Is, you can do this, and that you want to do this. That you it get, there's a lot of passion within you. That you're like, I want to be a stand-up comedian, or I want to be an athlete, or I want to be an engineer. Whatever it is, you've got to have passion for it, and then you must apply yourself. The hard work is the craft, and so as a stand-up comedian, it's the writing. Yeah. It's uh, develop uh, knowing how to develop jokes, and there's, in my opinion, there's like there's like a holy trinity to creativity, which is you need to con you need to re you need to consume a lot watch other comedians, uh, read a lot of books, take all that in, what, read the news, take in a lot of all the information of the things that you're interested in, and then you need to put in the output, which is the second part, which is write it, talk about it. And at first it won't be great, but slowly but surely it will get better. So as you write, you'll then learn, well, this bit's good, but this bit's not good. Let me yeah. cut this bit out and until it's refined and until you have a diamond, until you have a jewel in your hand. Yes. Um, and then after you've been doing that over weeks, months and years, you will have enough enough treasures to share with the world. Yeah. So it just takes time. Some people become very good at comedy very fast. Yeah. Uh, and I've seen that happen. Some people are very, very fast. Uh, some, most people take like a reasonable amount of time. It takes them a few years. It took me a few years. Uh, and some it may take even longer. So um, the hard work I would tell to anyone, whatever you do, is to focus on your craft. And I'm lucky. I, I, I also look to athletes. I look to people like Michael Jordan, yeah. the greatest basketball player ever. And when he started playing basketball, he wasn't concerned considered great. He didn't yeah. make his high school varsity team and he went home and he cried. And after that point, he worked on his craft so hard that he just became excellent. He became better than the best. Okay, so in your career, you faced a lot of rejection as well, where oh, people yes. didn't believe in you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then you look, they, you look back at them and you're like... Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Made. We all have to go through that in yeah. our lives you have to believe in yourself first. And when other people don't, that becomes your crucible. Yeah. You have to believe in yourself, work on your craft, and the day will come when suddenly you'll break through and people will, around you who didn't believe in you will go, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> he actually did yes, it. Yes. Um, and that's true for anyone. And there's plenty of examples, especially in the, the, wor in the world of athletes, yeah. of people who worked really hard and overcame their limitations and became really good. And the whole world turned around and went, wow. Yeah. Talking about spending a lot of time writing your material, you only arrived on Saturday and the yes. show on Sunday. How did you get to know about ESCOM and the other <laughs> Malawian talks? Are, are you a fast then? What are you? All oh, right. So uh, I've been doing stand-up for a long time, and I think one of the important things to learn as a stand-up comedian is that if you go to another town or yeah. another country specifically, it's important for you to learn about the people there. Yeah. You can't. You can If you want to, just take the jokes you do at home and do them somewhere else. But that's, in my opinion, lazy. Yeah. You have to tailor it for the people that you're in front of. Yeah. And I've come all the way to Malawi, so this is more than another town. It's in a whole different country with a whole different history, a whole different type of people, and I'm clearly an outsider. You can. Hear that in the way that I speak, and yeah. I thought it would be prudent of me, it would be wise of me to uh, find out what's happening in Malawi and yeah. what are the things. So, um, Deliso and I had a little walk around town, and, mm. I, and I'd ask him, What's this? What's going on? I'd ask him a bunch of questions, and he would tell me, Oh, you know, we got power cuts, and ESCOM is the, <laughs> is the big energy provider that's having problems supplying consistent energy. Yeah. Um, 
and I was like, okay, I'll keep that in mind. And then I saw a poster in the street for the various doctors that you have available in Malawi yes. that can cure your, your marital problems <laughs> or your need for a visa or exam scores. And I found yeah, this ones, yes. inherently funny. Yeah. And I was like, right, I'll keep those in mind. And yeah. then during the show, I opened with the, you know, the, doc the, the various doctors yeah. that you have here. People were like, oh, right, he's paid attention. He knows what's yeah. going on. Yeah. And then so the moment I saw the lights too. go yeah. out at the back of the room, I was like, I can see yes, Con have, like, uh, have jumped into action here. Uh, and the, the audience really appreciated yeah. that. All right. You're watching Times Exclusive on Times Television, TTV. The program is also on your radio, Times Radio. My guest in today's edition of the program is, of course, I started with Dariso Chaponda. Now I have Imran Yusuf. And the program is brought to you, courtesy of Rainbow Banks. Don't go anywhere. Wow. I think Cape Beach looks amazing on the door. Mm, the electric blue cuts it for me. Come on. Look at the tango, candy pink, mm -hmm. bent orange, okay, sweet line. Do you like what you see? You can dream it and live it. Download your Rainbow app today and begin the magic of transforming your home into a fabulous space. Rainbow Paints. Peace of mind. Part of the deal. Welcome back. You're watching Times Exclusive on Times Television TV, but you're also listening to the same program on Times Radio. My guest is Imran Yusuf. Uh, welcome back, Imran. Thank you for having me. So, yeah, uh, look, first time in Malawi. The show went down on Sunday. Yeah. How do you feel? I mean, having done that show, the next one, of course, is in Lilongwe, but the Blanta show, the success of the Blanta show. How does that make you feel? Oh, it, it was much more than I expected. I didn't realize there was going to be so many people. Yeah. Uh, and it was such a major event for Blantyre as well. Lots of people came out to see it. Right. It was sold out. There were loads of people turning up on the door trying to, try, <laughs> trying to bribe the staff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to, right, right. To, was to go and stand at the back of the room. <laughs> um, and so I, I'm really excited to be uh, here where stand-up comedy seems to be in its infancy in Malawi. And I'm really excited. I'm, I've been in comedy long enough to have seen uh, English-speaking comedy in its infancy in India, in Malaysia, in Singapore, and now English-speaking comedy in those countries has has blossomed into something incredible. And I would love to see that happen in Malawi, and I hope that the next time I come here, we're going to see uh, other local Malawian comedians coming through, doing open spots, and yeah, yeah, to share the stage with us, yeah. and then to take it on and to build their own amazing careers, because then that will allow Malawi to have a voice in the comedy world and to put Malawi on the on the comedy map. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's exciting, and the, the show that we've got coming up in the long way is in a, an amazing venue. Uh, I'm really looking for, uh, really looking forward to that one. Talking about the budding uh, talent, probably some Malawians, uh, those that are still struggling, mm -hmm. trying to say, look, I can make it uh, in the comedy industry. What would you say to them? They have been tried, they've been rejected, mm -hmm. but they still believe. They have, they're passionate about this. They know they can do it. Yes. Probably it's just not the right time. How, what do you say to them? Uh, what I'd say to any young uh, budding Malawian comedian is that it's really important that you believe in yourself and no matter how many rejections you get you just keep on going find ways to continue to develop your creativity keep writing keep reading keep developing your jokes and find anywhere and everywhere to be able to perform in front of an audience so hopefully you know if you start up a, a, a local comedy club in, in a venue that's uh, nearby your your home in, in your in your local town uh, get people to come and watch you and develop just take it from there and develop gig as much as you you can uh, watch clips of comedians that you like especially of Deliso's uh, stuff so you can see how he relates himself to a broader audience him being Malawian himself and keep, just keep on gigging and it's really difficult at the start at the start it's so difficult but you've got to keep on going and eventually you'll get to a point where you'll be so good so articulate so funny that you will be undeniable like people other maybe other places in Africa who have a more robust comedy circuit will be like great we'll, we'll, we'll have you on come and do 10 minutes or 20 minutes or half an hour but definitely do your best to develop the comedy scene here in Malawi because as I've said I've seen it happen in India in Malaysia in Singapore where a bunch of young people got together and said we want to do stand-up comedy they put on small events and slowly over years it became bigger and bigger and bigger, and some of them are now on Netflix. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, uh, 
every time you're watching comedy, issues of races will come on. I mean, I mean, mm. people joke about it. But now I want to ask it: Is it an issue where people look at you and say, "But dude, you can do it. You know, you're Asian, like, mm -hmm. you're black. Right. You can do it." You know, has that probably did you face any of that, or does that even happen where people look at you? Just the impression that they they look at you and they believe. Mm. I've never seen a funny Asian. <laughs> um, I'm quite lucky. Um, the comedy scene in the UK is, which is where I've, yeah, you know, really yeah. grown, so has up. transformed yeah, in the last 10, 15 years yeah. massively, uh, mm. or, or 20 years to be honest, uh, has transformed. So when I was a teenager and I was watching stand-up comedy, there were mostly uh, white and some black comedians, mostly yeah. uh, Caribbean uh, yeah. from the Caribbean, yeah. and we'd watch them and go, oh well, wow, they're doing it. So then surely I must be able to, to be able to do it as well. And slowly, um, so before I think Asian or Indian comedians got onto the comedy circuit in the UK, black Caribbean, black African comedians were, had got there first. Yeah. And they, they inspired us to go, we, we are also part of, we're also from a minority, yeah. hopefully we can have a space here as well. Yeah. And we got into that space and lots of us did, lots yeah. of us did. And we started to play the comedy clubs and then we would go to the Edinburgh Festival and do one hour shows. We would learn to become the host of a show and we built up a much bigger tool set of comedy yeah. uh, to the point now there's lots. So in the UK, there's lots of every kind of comedian you can think about. There's, you know, obviously white comedians, there are black comedians, brown comedians, uh, uh, comedians, uh, uh, Malaysian, Chinese, Japanese, uh, gay comedians, transgender yeah. comedians, every type of human being uh, yeah. you can think of is doing comedy in the UK. And that it shows the world that no matter who you are, and what background you come from, whatever your story is, you're a human being, you have the ability to articulate yourself and you can become a comedian and tell your story to the world and be funny. <laughs> yeah. Look, um, different artists, comedians have got different styles. Others would want to leave the best for last that, you know, they will say their last joke and while everybody ups is up clapping, that's how they woke up. What's your style? What is your style? How would you like to enter the stage and leave the stage? Do you have any style or anything goes, man? Uh, style, I, it changes. When you start out comedy, uh, I re when I started out comedy, I wanted to be like Chris Rock. Okay. That was my comedy hero. Co okay. Chris Rock, at least back in the day, in like the 90s, and in the early 2000s, he was like, he was like the Malcolm X of stand-up. Yeah. And I was like, that's the style that I would like to emulate. That's the style I want to do. And I, and I tried to copy that a little bit. Mm. But over time, what you find is that in stand-up comedy, you will eventually, your own voice will evolve. Yeah. And so I think my style is, <laughs> sort of think my style is, uh, I, I like to be uh, hard hitting to the point. Yeah. I don't waste words with ums and ahs and yeah. how's everybody doing and like I try not to waste too much time doing that. Let's get yeah. right into the yeah. it, into the jokes. Yeah. Uh, like you know uh, Mike Tyson of yeah. comedy. Like yeah. did, 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 just go for about. the Let's just go for it. Yeah. Ah, okay. Exactly. So I think I'd like to think that's my style, but I can adapt. Sometimes okay. if you have an audience and they're all relaxed yeah. and they and they don't want you to be like yeah. this, yeah. then I relax. Yeah. But if the audience is hyped and they're really excited, I get in there and, yeah. <laughs> and do that as well. Yeah. When you get to chat with musicians you ask them what is your favorite track that you've done you probably your own track they will tell you is it the same with comedy like you have this joke you tell it every time each time because it's so funny that it even makes you laugh <laughs> um, yeah I, I there's many so what will happen as a comedian unfortunately uh, musicians have an advantage if you write a great song yeah everybody wants to listen to it forever yeah forever if you're a comedian and you have a great joke everyone wants to listen to it but once they've heard it a few times yeah. the next they time they see you they yeah. want, now we want something else yeah so i fortunately because of my writing discipline if you go onto YouTube and you watch any of my content, yeah. uh, and please do that, it really helps. I've got over 7 million hits, but if you can get me to 100 million, I'd appreciate yeah, why not? that. Yeah. <laughs> if you watch any of my content on YouTube, yeah. uh, you will not see me do any of that stuff live. Because once I do it on television, once it's out, I drop it. Okay. Right? Or, yeah. or I'll do a tour and then yeah. drop it. Yeah. And so everything everyone saw me do here in Blantyre, Blantyre. Yes. Uh, uh, it's not recorded yet. Okay. But this is the stuff that I'm working with. Yeah. But one day, everything that I've done here, I will do on television. Okay. And after I've done that television, I stop and I yeah. write the new show. Okay. So, back to my question. Do you have a joke? That you think oh, you is so funny. You, yes, that is so funny that it makes you laugh. Even as you laugh it at does. your own joke. I have many. I have many jokes. Okay, like that. tell I me one. Many. I can tell you one joke. Yeah. Is, is this, uh, so this is an old one. I'll share the, uh, this one. Is that 
when I started out comedy, I was really upset that every time I watched the news, uh, the news seemingly demonized Muslim people in, yeah. in every sphere are of you, life. Are you, are you Muslim? Yes, I'm obviously. With okay. a name like Imran Yusuf, yeah. you have to be Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. Right? Yeah. So uh, that really upset me. And I got so wound up that I just thought, and often when I'd go to America, I would find that the border control people sometimes can be quite aggressive and mm. mean if you, if you look like this yeah. and you, your name is Imran Yusuf. Yeah. So I, I would joke in my head, I go, last time I went to America, the border control agent said to me, uh, what do you think you're doing here in the United States of America? What is the nature and purpose of your of your business here in the United States? And I told him, I'll go, well, first I'm going to kill all the natives and steal their land. Yeah. And then I'm going to build the country off the back of African slaves. Yeah. And when they start complaining about racism, I'm going to stick them into ghettos full of guns, alcohol and crack cocaine. But oh, it looks like somebody's beaten me to it. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> exactly that you. <laughs> And when I would do that joke, it yeah. would feel that uh, there was a sense of justice yeah. in me. Like I'd yeah. stuck it yeah. to this, you know, Western American yeah. imperial. Yeah, rub it in their face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rub it in their face <laughs> yeah. uh, to remind them that you know there are many crimes that the United States have committed in order yeah. to build their nation and continues to do around the world. Yeah. And that's the beautiful thing about stand-up comedy: you can be political and yeah. you can say something to evoke justice in people's hearts and minds. Yeah. Uh, so that's what, when I—that was my first best but, joke. Okay, so how sensitive are you supposed to be when you tell such jokes? Because look, black people call each other the N-word. Okay, right. so they'll call each other the N-word. Right. When you do a joke about religious. Yes. Like, I think you did one where you said that uh, maybe I have my backpack. All right. And right, then right, I'll, right. I'll say a few phrases yeah, and yeah, boom! Yeah. <laughs> don't you get people like saying, but hey, man, you're pushing it, yeah? Don't, don't, uh, don't, don't say such things because these are sensitive things, you know? Well, I'm very. You know, you don't you know, yeah, understand why I, I understand use, what you're I use saying, the yeah. So, I, yeah. I'm very. Uh, I think it's prudent to show a certain level of respect. Yeah. If you say something to dehumanize a people and say that they are one dimensional, you know, bad people, savage people, or backwards people, that's very cruel. And comedy, in my opinion, should punch up to people who are oppressing you or people who are, are bullying you. So uh, in terms of, uh, I can't comment on the use of the N-word because I don't do that. Uh, yeah. that's, <laughs> it's, yeah. not, it's not my experience. Yeah. But uh, in terms of the joke that I did about the backpack is that I explained that in life, you have to deal, you have to play the hand that life has dealt you. And so sometimes I understand that, you know, if somebody gives me any hassle, if someone is aggressive towards me and tries to give me trouble, then I'm not too far away from putting on a bag and saying, you know, <laughs> reciting a bit of Arabic and making them feel uncomfortable. So there I'm just being very gentle with it. Yeah. Uh, I'm just pi I'm painting a picture in your mind, and you're mm. drawing the you're making so the I conclusions. So I need to understand that metaphorically. It's not like uh, yeah. you know who, who knows what he thinks probably about <laughs> the backpack. Something <laughs> that you know. Yeah. 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 So we've all got to you know. So it I can see how that can work to my advantage. Like maybe if I want a train, if I want a, a seat on a train, and there yeah. are no seats, you know, if you have a bag. <laughs> And you start praying a little bit, people, they'll make a move. So I play with those ideas. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, that's, uh, that, uh, that's okay to do. And also that's my experience as a, as a Muslim person who's dealt yeah. with, you know, anti-Muslim uh, yeah. se uh, sentiment. That's, uh, I, I feel that I, I can do that. I'm not talking about somebody else's religious experience. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's my experience or, yeah. or, or my uh, so experience. You, you in don't get world. in trouble with the leaders? In uh, the no, no. That, fortunately, um, fortunately, most of the Muslim community in the UK uh, um, and even the Middle East really have really supported my work because yeah. what's important, what I'm, what's important is that through my comedy, I'm humanizing my community. Like every every comedian who comes from a minority group. Uh, when they get up and they speak, they're humanizing their community, saying, we are people, we have feelings. We're scared as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> we're, 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 uh, we have hopes and dreams as well. And so my jokes always come from a place of like, how do I humanize my community and show the rest of the world who doesn't know anything about Muslims or Islam or Indian people that I'm just like them. Okay. Now we're coming to close to the end of our program. Are there any regrets in this career? In your case, like, well, maybe I've, I've, I've continued with my video development career, mm -hmm. do you have any regrets being a stand-up comedian? Uh, I would say no, and I think part of that is down to, I'm 42 now, so okay. I'm a bit older. I feel, I feel that life begins in your 40s because when you're 18, 20, you're technically adult, but yeah. really yeah. you're a you're an idiot yeah. because you you're just a child just, with yeah. the license of an adult. You have yeah. no adult experience. Yeah. But by the time you get into your 40s, you've had 20 years worth of adult experience and yeah. you've made mistakes. Yeah. And, you know, and uh, if you asked me, you know, maybe five or 10 years ago, I'd be like, oh, yeah, maybe this regret, maybe that regret. But mm. now I'm like, no, I appreciate how life is unfolding for me. 
and you can always look back and go, I regret this, I regret that, but I don't. I, I appreciate what each day brings and all the things that I didn't get, all the bad things that happened help shape me who I've become today and who I am today is a much more grateful person. And ultimately, that's the ultimate world. You know, there is no wealth without gratitude. And no matter how much money you've got, if you're not grateful, truly grateful from here, you're never truly wealthy. And so that's, it's, it's brought me here. So I have, I have no regrets, only gratitude. All right. Tell us about the Lilongwe show. What should people expect from Imran? Oh, from the Lilongwe show, uh, mm. a little bit more uh, localized material uh, yeah. since I've more been here a few, more, a few more days. <laughs> yeah, more ESCOM stuff. Uh, hopefully they can keep the power running. Yeah. Uh, and let's see mm. what, uh, what the doctors in Lilongwe can offer. I mean, yeah. over here it's quite broad. The doctors in Blantai can offer you anything. Yeah, so visas. May, maybe the doctors in Lilongwe can get you, uh, take, take you to Mars. Yeah, they bring back lovers, <laughs> yeah, lost bring, lovers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, lost lovers. Well, until you learn to love yourself, there's no point waiting on a lost lover. You, you need to, you know, uh, uh, truly love and appreciate yourself. So that's the magic trick. You don't need to go and see Dr. Aziz now. Okay. <laughs> Just take that example. All right. So your parting words, what would you say to your audience, those people that probably didn't know you, they've seen the Planta show now, they become your fans. What else do they expect? you plan to come back to Malawi? What is it that you want to say as we're coming to the end of the, oh. uh, of the program? Oh, well, thank you very much for having me in Malawi. I'm very grateful for uh, Deliso for being so generous, uh, for bringing me out here. I would love to come back to Malawi and to perform here uh, more often. Uh, parting words is that for those of you who want to be comedians or want to be anything in your life, remember first you've got to believe in yourself and then work hard on your craft. And those, that's the, that's the, the magic formula uh, is to be, you know, believe in yourself, have passion, work hard on your craft and become truly excellent at it just like Michael Jordan did in basketball or the many athletes that we look around and see how excellent they've become uh, and good luck with it and all remember that Nintendo means uh, you can work hard but in the end it's all in heaven's hands so be grateful for what you got and uh, try to smile every day thank you very much Imran. thank you thank you Imran Yusuf bring us to the end of today's edition of the program area on I had that is so in the same program the two are also going to have another show in Lilongwe, which you don't want to miss because of the success of the Blanta show. My name is Wander Musisia. On behalf of the technical expertise provided by Kondwani Mohone and David Masea, and on behalf of our sponsors, Rainbow Paints, until next time, goodbye.